Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, coming back from your break, coming back from the form of posters or from the coffee machine. I'm glad you're here because uh, I'm so excited to announce uh, a keynote speaker for today. Uh, we have Jamie Tyler. And um, if any of you has an interest in transcranial ultrasound stimulation, then I'm sure you've heard of uh, Jamie. And I'm sure that many of you have read his papers and seen his work. It is his seminal work um, that, that restarted uh, the interest in possible neuromodulatory effects of ultrasound. And we've also seen today that this is a technique with a very long history. I mean, we're talking about uh, immediately after the Second World War of the, in the last century. But, but it's especially in the last decades that we have seen this re-emergence and a reappreciation of the biomechanical effects and possibilities allowed by ultrasonic stimulation. Now, and here today we have Jamie, um, Jamie from Arizona State University. I'm very excited um, to hear what you have to tell us about what you've been doing, what you're currently doing, and the future of ultrasonic neuromodulation. Jamie, please join us. Hey, Leonard, thanks. Um, i share my screen now. Okay, can you see my screen, Leonard? That's perfect, thank you. And then, uh, does it advance fine? It does, yep, works brilliant. Great, brilliant. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, today's been fantastic to hear uh, the new and emerging investigators and uh, where they'll be going. So first, uh, I always open with a disclosure. Um, many of you know this, but uh, I'm, um, I'm an academic entrepreneur. I'm a co-founder of IST. Uh, I'm an inventor on 20 issued US patents, plus uh, 20 additional uh, applications on uh, electrical and ultrasonic neuromodulation, as well as pharmacological and psychedelic uh, methods of treatment. Um, we actively uh, practice in this field and, and commercialize um, in various methods. So um, <clears throat> I'll start with some brief background. I think there's, um, you know, we've talked today a lot about the history of using ultrasound for neuromodulation, and there's certainly some some precedents. Um, even deep brain stimulation has a history dating back um, almost, you know, 60 or 70 years now, um, using electrodes that they're implanted electrodes. Um, to modulate various nuclei in the brain to achieve certain functions. Vagal nerve stimulation, many of you interested in uh, neuromodulation have heard about vagal nerve stimulation recently, particularly for its ability to modulate uh, uh, anti-inflammatory pathways via cholinergic uh, modulation. And optogenetics, I'm sure everyone's heard of optogenetics, which has kind of revolutionized some of the approaches for the way that we study biology. Back in the 1950s, even, even before that, as you, you've heard today, people have shown using uh, ultrasound um, that they could induce either peripheral activity or modulate central activity. Um, most of this work has been using continuous wave ultrasound and um, fairly high intensity that would produce thermal changes, right? So temperature changes. And so although you can focus ultrasound, deep in the brain using the methods, you could you would modulate activity based on thermal change or temperature change. So when I started my career um, as a scientist, after my first postdoc, I, I had set up my lab with some optogenetic tools. And uh, <clears throat> this was in 2006, 2007. And uh, I had always had an interest in the mechanobiology of, of brain function. So uh, the physical properties of the brain are often overlooked. And when you look at the physics of the brain, um, the materials are viscoelastic, right? So they're non-Newtonian fluids, and they're ideally suitable for carrying and propagating mechanical waves or sound waves, such as ultrasound. And um, so I kind of departed my biophysics training and synaptic plasticity and transmission training and, and uh, using optogenetics and, and lasers to probe brain function and began using ultrasound. And, and what we did that was differently, uh, that was different was um, we really ignored the ability of ultrasound to increase temperature and started to, rather than using continuous waves, we started to modulate ultrasound in pulse wave modes and using a, a multitude of frequencies 
um, that would more actively emulate what might be happening at a biophysical level related to an ion channel and the ion channels in activation, activation kinetics and its opening and closing behaviors, right? So um, we took a completely different approach um, and we're able to uncover, um, we published in 2008, uh, we, we showed using organic calcium indicators that we can modulate uh, brain activity in slices. And this was an organotypic slices. We also used uh, optogenetic probes. So this is uh, image, well, it says it can't play the media, but some of you have seen it. Um, the, uh, the movie must be somewhere else, but basically modulating synaptic activity. And we were able to record that optically using a thigh one synaptofluorin mouse um, or tissue from a thigh one synaptofluorin mouse. We then immediately translated our findings. I got an email um, uh, from Bill Newsom at Stanford University in, in 2008. And he was like, well, in 2008, 2009, he was like, asked me, do, did I believe we could generate phosphines um, in non-human primates using ultrasound? And, and so we started to explore a little bit and we couldn't get things to work. We tried lots of stuff. Those were fun days in the lab. Um, it was kind of chaos, controlled chaos. But one day we uh, we accidentally induced a seizure in an animal. Um, and once we induced a seizure in an animal using ultrasound, we knew at that point that it was completely feasible. We just had to dial in the right uh, right waveforms, if you will, uh, right acoustic kind of stimulation parameters to be able to control it and not induce a seizure. And so from there, we published that paper in Neuron and then uh, rapidly published a methods paper um, and nature protocols um, right after that, showing that we could attenuate um, epileptic activity that was induced using canic acid. Um, and so we described those methods and those methods have that we described starting in 2000, late 2007, 2008, have become the basis for what most people use today to modulate neural activity in the peripheral and the central nervous system. Um, I struggled to get, as an early investigator, I struggled to get uh, funding from NIH. I still have not received funding from NIH or NSF for that matter, um, but, but I've been extensively funded by uh, DARPA and the DOD um, and venture capital. So what we did, we, you know, I really believed in these methods. And so rather than fight NIH and study section, um, I decided to, to start a company I found that a company and was awarded an SBIR from uh, SBIR from the U.S. Army to work on uh, applications using ultrasound for post-translational, I mean, post-traumatic uh, pain, as well as for modulating sensory processes in the brain. I was also awarded a DARPA Young Faculty Award um, to to start to to really be the tip of the spear for these methods and their applications. And so, using money from venture capital, we started to do animal testing. Um, we started to work on product development and what this might look like in the future. And we did large animal studies and pigs. Um, I traveled to Kenya and recorded um, from deep brain regions um, in particular formation and, and non-human primates. Uh, those were you know, we, we showed, we demonstrated to ourselves and to others, scientists that were around at the time that we could modulate deep brain activity. And we, I had a McKnight Award with Dora Sal at Caltech, and we were able to show using, um, through collaborations using mind contrast agents at the very early time that we could modulate deep brain activity in a focal manner. And so using that data, um, we really armed ourselves with some other data from, uh, experiments we had been doing at the time using simultaneous EEG and MRI and ultrasound in the periphery to demonstrate that the, all the systems were compatible and safe um, and working in conjunction with each other. And that was about 2012. Uh, I was at Virginia Tech at the time. And uh, what we ended up showing was that we were able to uh, modulate somatosensory cortex activity in humans. And we published that in Nature Neuroscience. What we showed was um, that we had a spatial resolution that was superior to any other non-invasive neuromodulation method at the time. Um, and we were able to show that we could not only modulate the somatosensory revoke potentials, but we were able to modulate tactile uh, somatosensory discrimination. 
I think it's important to recognize when we talk about the spatial resolution, I think it's often hard to visualize what the spatial resolution may be compared to something like a deep brain stimulating electrode. It's really easy to, to we all have these models that are created using different methods with finite element um, methods to, modul to, to uh, model the electric field distribution, the spatial distribution of the electric field in the brain. But it's hard to envision what that might be for a deep brain stimulating electrode if you're not familiar with working with the technology. And so in this slide, I've just illustrated the spatial, the spatial resolution for what we showed um, using transcranial focused ultrasound. This is a single element transducer that had a graphite concave con convex lens. And uh, that was able to allow us to focus in the near field. So you can focus sound just like you can focus light, right? So just like you can build a telescope or a microscope using simple lenses or compound lenses, you can do the same thing to focus ultrasound. Um, but you use different materials, right? Instead of uh, silica glass, you might use graphite, for example. And so being able to focus in the near field, we weren't so concerned with some of the offset that might be caused by uh, phase distortions from the skull. And our electrophysiological evidence did demonstrate that we had this functional spatial resolution. And so if you look at this resolution compared to, so 0.5 megahertz gives you a spatial resolution that's about the same spatial size that you would get from the electric field generated by a deep brain stimulating electrode, right? And so people can argue about that all day long if you want, but the physics of the ultrasound and all the modeling as well as all the empirical data do seem to show that you get a focal spot that's about the size of a grain of rice, right? Um, and so being able to have that spatial resolution deep in the brain um, and do, to do so non-invasively is incredibly powerful. And this is an image from uh, Wynn Legon, his lab once he left my lab, when did his postdoc with me, and then went to University of Minnesota and is now at the University of Virginia. Um, after our, our initial observations, there were a flurry of papers that came out, um, and we've seen data from some of these today. I just wanted to point out some of them. Um, so from Sunshik Yu's lab, he showed in a, a series of papers really that he could not only modulate the, the sensory evoked activity, but he could directly activate sensory activity in the brain that was, um, that was associated with a, uh, an evoked potential as well as a psychophysical ability to discriminate different sensations, whether it's seeing a phosphine or feeling different sensations on the hand. Um, when Legon has shown um, quite nicely that he can modulate somatosensory activity um, that reaches the cortex by using a single element transducer to, to alter thalamic activity. He's also shown that, it, that you know, he's, he was the first one to demonstrate. We worked really hard at Virginia Tech on combining focused ultrasound and functional MRI, and then I just let Wynn take that to University of Minnesota, and he went on there to show that they could do this in a 7T environment. And he's also gone ahead and shown that he could integrate focus ultrasound combined with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And being able to probe the effects of focus ultrasound on brain activity in, method, in using uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation as a probe stimulus uh, can be a very powerful um, method. And then uh, other work from, from uh, Sunshik's group, again, showing that they can modulate different sites such as somatosensory cortex and visual cortex simultaneously in, in human subjects uh, has been shown since 2016. Work from Leonard, um, I, I'm really excited about Leonard's work and what he's gonna do over the next few years. Um, I look forward to working with him closely and supporting his work however we can. Um, he, you know, he, they, People had shown in non-human primates up on this point that you could modulate brain activity and you could modulate human activity, but all the all the experiments had shown that it was an acute modulation, right? So our results initially showed in animals that we could directly stimulate activity versus modulate sensory evoked activity or some other type of evoked activity. And then other people had shown that they could, Sunshik Yu had shown that he could directly evoke activity that would be correlated with sensations. And then Leonard's group, what they did in non-human primates is they showed that you could produce plasticity, right? And so from a therapeutic standpoint, when you think about translating these technologies for therapeutic applications, um, and this is similar to what Jan was mentioning earlier, we need to know the duration of the effect and how long these effects last. And so what Leonard shows was that by focally modulating one particular node within a circuit, you could get long lasting effects across the circuit. 
Um, and that being able to translate the, that ability to induce plasticity, particularly in prefrontal circuits, um, has massive uh, therapeutic potential, I believe. So mechanisms of action. Um, so I'm going to jump in here because we missed some talks earlier. So Jan um, had mentioned he published some work earlier. Um, so we had, in 2012, we started recording from TREC channels, and we had a whole series of investigations using TREC channels and, and CHO cells and oocytes, um, and then had been doing some other work um, with Matthias Snyder at Boston University at the time, looking at uh, membrane stress strain relationships using um, uh, basically FRET techniques and looking at uh, phospholipid interactions. And so we had known that you could directly modulate. Um, TREC1 activity as well as membrane activity. And then Juan published a nice paper showing that um, this was true. And he showed that not only could you modulate TREC1 activity, but you could also alter the activity of sodium channels, right? And so this goes back to some of the original observations we had optically, we could modulate sodium, ac sodium channel activity, or at least sodium channels that were, that were um, sensitive to trototoxin. Um, so voltage-gated sodium channels. Now being able to do patch clamp experiments and detail current voltage relationships and the biophysical activity of the channel, um, I think is like this is going to break open a completely new frontier in the way that we look at channels and the way that we look at how they behave in the nervous system. Um, we missed uh, Sergeant Yu's talk earlier, which is uh, unfortunate, but um, he's in been working with Mikhail Shapiro at Caltech. Mikhail has been on fire recently. He's published a number of really, really elegant papers showing that the, the utility of ultrasound for, <clears throat> for various methods in biology. So not only in neuroscience, but the ability to, to image molecular activity and genetic activity using various probes and has done a lot of exciting work. Um, but he's also been working on the mechanisms of action. So him, Shai Shaham, um, there's uh, many other groups around the world that have been working on exactly how uh, ultrasound modulates activity. And what Mikkel has shown is that uh, you can modulate um, voltage-gated channels, but that there's mechanosensitive channels, right? So that are, that, that are act as calcium amplification of the voltage-gated sodium channels, right? So the story here is that it's not just conventional voltage-gated truck channels or polymodal channels, they're mechanosensitive as well as voltage-gated. But now we have a picture where we have different types of channels. So TRIP4 channels, our TRIP-M4 channels, T-type calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels, voltage-gated sodium channels. And now we go to purely mechanosensitive channels such as piezo one channels, right? And so, this is work showing um, from Lisan's group showing that piezo one tends to be uh, one of the channels that's most uh, sensitive to the acoustic fields that are transmitted by ultrasound that's used in ultrasonic neuromodulation. What I think is really nice about this study is they show that not only is the channel active, piezo one is active, but the downstream um, uh, consequences are also active. So you, they, they show that, you know, there's an increase in uh, intermediate early uh, genes, um, CFOS, CREB, um, and so that there's downstream consequences of the channel activity and not just of the channel. Jan also mentioned, I think this is this is elegant work from Justin Lee's lab um, that's has been very exciting, um, I think, and, and is often overlooked, and that's that uh, ultrasonic neuromodulation can activate astrocytic trip A1 channels and via trip A1 activation of best one uh, modulate the activity of synaptic and MDA receptors. And so the when we think about neurobiology, you know, it's often there's the 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 neurotriad, if you will, a glial cell, a neuron, and a, a blood vessel. Um, it's really the interaction of those three, three things that produce kind of a functional outcome at a cellular level. <clears throat> and so I think it absolutely needs to be taken into account, like the role of ultrasound and how it affects um, astrocytes. So I'll come back to that in just a moment. So gen sonogenetics, I think this, so the work from sonogenet on sonogenetics um, from Sri Chalasani's lab at um, 
the Salk Institute is, it really kind of provides uh, the last compelling piece of evidence that ultrasound is acting on mechanical sensitive channels. And so what they've shown in this paper is they've characterized the novel behavior. I'm going to show you the movie. They've characterized the novel behavior by expressing a, a mechanical sensitive channel in a group of neurons that doesn't normally express those channels. Um, and then they've gone on to basically use logic and rationale that has been adapted from optogenetics. So with optogenetics, when GFP was first identified, cloned, and synthesized, right, it wasn't a very powerful protein because it had a low quantum yield, right? So when you excited it, um, you had a low number of photons that was emitted. And so what Carl Dizeroth and other people did is they started to develop Richard Chen, many, many people, Roger Chen, um, they started to develop uh, libraries and, and, and clone proteins from nature that had different properties. And so what they did here is they starting to show that in nature, there's channels that are found. And so this is an example of an ion channel in a mimosa plant that's activated by six megahertz ultrasound. And so they're going through and screening channels and their mechanosensitive properties to try to identify the channels that will be most sensitive and then express those in the main expression vectors and a la sauna genetics. Um, safety, we, I'm not going to belabor this too much. I think, um, you know, we've been very careful in the, uh, our approach to using ultrasound, especially as we transition from bench to bedside. Um, and started to use this in, in human subjects and human clinical trials. Um, it, you know, look, there's the, the main thing is skull heating, right? Like, I think we've talked about the duration of the waveform. Most of the literature to date has shown that there's no side effects or negligible side effects. Um, but it is a very powerful technology and a very powerful tool. Look, you're using essentially the same type of technology and tool that other, like, in SciTech uses to focally ablate brain regions, um, and that is not an uh, unintended consequence that you want to have happen, so uh, please use caution. Um, when uh, Legon has published a, a really nice paper on safety, um, it's a retrospective paper on safety of the several human studies that they ran at University of Minnesota, and I'd recommend that you all take a look at that. So the last little bit of the talk, I'm going to talk about the translational progress that's been made for different brain and mental health applications. Um, so we've talked, you've heard about InsideTech, and InsideTech's work um, has been amazing and transformed the field. Um, uh, it's archaic in the sense that it literally is burning a hole in the brain for a therapeutic effect or a hole in the tissue. Um, but uh, what they have achieved now is that they have a method that's a non, it's an incisionless neurosurgical method to treat essential tremor that's been approved for, for reimbursement in all 50 states in the US and throughout Asia and around the world. And there's multiple indications that are being sought after now. The problem with the technology is there's no way to know where to make the ablation prior to getting the beam in that location, right? And so the patient's awake the entire time. By contrast, it's really hard. You can't identify the VPL, so the, the portion of the thalamus, is the sensory thalamus from the motor thalamus of the VIM. The ablation is made in the VIM to treat a central tremor. You don't want to make an ablation in the VPL because then a person may have, you know, loss of sensory input to their face or hands. And so what they do is they, they transiently heat the brain up. And once the, the tremor stops, they then kind of lock everything in location and then perform a longer duration continuous wave event to ablate that region of the brain. And so being able to functionally interrogate, probe, or map the thalamus prior to uh, ablation would be really powerful. So Jeff Elias um, at University of Virginia um, conducted a series of studies in pigs, and Jeff is fantastic. He's the, the functional neurosurgeon that got most of the studies through um, for the FDA approval of the InsideTech ablation device. Um, but so what Jeff did with uh, Dalla Piazza was one of his neurosurgical fellows there. Um, they modified the InsideTech machine to instead of deliver high intensity focused ultrasound to deliver low intensity focused ultrasound. So they pulsed the ultrasound in the ways that we had described. And what they were able to show is that with low FU or lil FU or low intensity focused ultrasound, they were able to non-invasively map the thalamus 
and see this electrophysiologically. And so being able to um, map the, the region prior to a treatment, whether that's an ablation or insertion of a deep brain stimulating electrode, has tremendous implications for the way that we go about using um, uh, neurosurgical interventions. This is also a very exciting uh, development over the past year. Um, Stores Medical and uh, several other groups have started to use um, transcranial pulsed ultrasound or transcranial focused ultrasound for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they've shown this in animals as well as human trials. And they're actually, uh, it has a CE mark now, I believe, and is being used in patients. <clears throat> um, it's a little bit different than some of the methods we've been talking about today. It actually uses a shock wave. Um, it's an electromagnetic um, actuator to deliver an impulse wave or a shock wave. Um, so kind of like a blast wave, but just an impulse. But that then they pulse that, and when they pulse that, they produce essentially ultrasound fields, and those ultrasound fields um, in their hands have been shown to improve Alzheimer's disease. We may want to use a little bit of caution when interpreting these results because there's other work from groups in Australia, um, and then other work that's just been done in the field of stroke and as well as Alzheimer's disease, and it could be that microglia provide uh, a, a response, and so there, it, it's possible that there could be a um, uh, an acute brain injury, and then the, the brain injury, the, the microglia respond to the injury to then produce a therapeutic effect. And I think that's unresolved. And that primarily comes from work on blood, blood brain barrier disruption, and people have been using blood, they're disrupting the blood brain barrier and looking for therapeutic effects and delivery of drugs. And when they find they disrupt the brain barrier, blood brain barrier without delivering the drug, they can still achieve some of the same therapeutic outcomes. And so I think there's still mechanisms of action have to be resolved. Nonetheless, it's a very exciting technology and I think a breakthrough for treatment in Alzheimer's um, if they continue to make progress. Transcranial focused ultrasound as a treatment for central pain disorder has been he. Uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, just had a nice review um, outlining why transcranial focused ultrasound is uh, idealized compared to a lot of the other methods for treatment of central pain. Mark George, uh, his group, along with uh, Sasha Bistritsky, who's another notable figure in the field and has been a, a forerunner in the field for quite some time, has uh, shown that they are able to modulate the thalamus, the human thalamus, in an MR environment and alter, they can basically induce uh, anti nociceptive uh, properties and change the essentially what Wynn had shown earlier using neurophysiology. They're able to show this psychophysically that they can alter the somatosensory thresholds in a way that reduces uh, the painful stimulus, um, what would be recognized as a painful stimulus following um, focused ultrasound treatment. We've been working with um, John Allen for a number of years, I guess since 2012, perhaps. Um, this is a device, this is a, I, a company that I was a founder of for a while, um, Neurotrek, but Neurotrek became Think. Uh, Nonetheless, when we started, we were flying under the radar, and this is a device that we built. Um, I still have, it's, we call this the famous black box. <laughs> uh, it's pretty amazing. But uh, nonetheless, this powered a single element focus transducer in a way that we could conduct bonded trials. Uh, we sponsored research at the University of Arizona with John Allen and uh, with, G with uh, Jay Sanguetti. Uh, and Stuart Hammeroff, and those have been a lot of fun. Stuart was also a pioneer in the field. Uh, I remember meeting Stuart um, in Europe. I don't remember exactly which country, where were we? Sweden, I think. Um, but Stuart was, at, he was wheeling ultrasound machines out of the operating room and running studies on human subjects to try and alter their mood and then would wheel it back into the operating room, clean it up. And so I was like, look, Stuart, if you're brave enough to do this work, well, I'll build you a device and, and do something. So they did. And um, <clears throat> it took a while, but what they've shown, what we've recently shown and published in a couple of papers was that we could modulate um, by targeting prefrontal cortex, we could start to alter functional connectivity in the frontal cortex and nodes of interest related to depression. And then we ran um, another trial on depressed individuals using the same device, this is a, it's a, ended up being a low end, but um, I think this supports a larger scale trial that we're gonna be starting to kick off sometime in the next couple of months. Um, but what we found here is that people who have high rumination or high worry or high anxiety 
um, tend to, we are able to decrease their anxiety or their, their worry states. Work in my lab has started to focus on, I guess for the past few years, we've, we've been doing, we've been working primarily on um, non-invasive electrical methods <clears throat> in the academic lab. Um, but we have had a couple of projects, collaborative projects, and I've had one graduate student who's been working hard on trying to understand how we can modulate certain emotional processes towards treating mental health disorders. And so part of this work is in collaboration with uh, Marco Santello, who's the director of my department, and then Justin Fine, who is one of Marco's postdocs, and Maria, who's in my lab. And what they showed is they can modulate human response inhibition. Um, and this paper is under review now, I believe. Um, it's been back and forth with some journals. So what Maria did, Maria is like, she's a really creative student and a person that uh, with a lot of my students that I try to just give them space um, versus direction, um, which can be a struggle for the students sometimes. But when you see what they produce, when they just have a creative blank slate, I think it's, it's amazing. So Maria started in my lab when I was actually in Boston running a company. And so she was here by herself at Arizona State University. And uh, she was really interested in how we could use ultrasound to alter states of consciousness and states of emotional awareness. And so she put together a really nice project. She'll be defending her thesis in three or four weeks um, and using focus ultrasound to target the dorsal ACC and the insula um, while conducting simultaneous 64 channel EEG and then using a flanker task, an emotional flanker task, um, looking at neutral faces and fear faces under congruent and incongruent conditions. Um, which she essentially has shown, she's been able to, she's a powerful series of studies. In fact, I don't even know what to do with them right now. I'm like, there's so much. I, there's, I want to write one of those old journal of physiology papers that were like 150 pages, right? And 30 figures, like four back-to-back -back papers. Um, but I don't think we can do that these days. But um, nonetheless, what she's able to show is that what we could find is that modulation of delta and theta very early on in during the sensory processing seems to be key for um, outcomes and error related to um, when there's an emotional conflict. And so we were, were pretty confident in our results on the dorsal ACC, the insula for reasons that Brad and Christina and others have talked about today. We're a little bit less confident in our data on the targeting the insula. It's a little bit harder target, it's a harder region to target primarily because it's hard to avoid the right inferior frontal gyrus. And so we're still continuing to work out methods that um, will allow us to have more confidence in those data. We believe in them. I just think that across individuals, it's harder to be confident that you're hitting the target, right? So um, and I'd like to know that at least in 70% or 80% or 85% of the individuals, we have a high degree of confidence for hitting the target. So modeling, um, and visualization uh, will come in. Those will be incredibly important for being able to, to verify that you're hitting the target or at least increase your confidence that you're targeting the right location. Applications in the peripheral nervous system. Um, it's been shown that you can modulate the vagus nerve um, using ultrasound. This has certain advantages um, that have begun to catch the attention of GE and Medtronic and, and other uh, large big pharmaceutical companies, primarily for the reason when you modulate the vagus nerve, you can have side effects on the cardiac activity, particularly with cervical vagal nerve stimulation because baroreceptors are located right next to the, where you place the electrode. And so you can have uh, effects on blood pressure as well as uh, cardiac effects, such as producing bradycardia, for example. That's a known side effect of vagal nerve stimulation. However, when you use ultrasound, uh, you can produce anti-inflammatory effects that have been described by Kevin Tracy and kind of really the, the part of the purpose of the entire bioelectronics industry has reemerged. Um, this idea of being able to, to, to uh, electrically mimic the activity of a drug, but by doing it using an electrode placed in the body. And so GE has recently shown that they can modulate splenic activity. So modulation of neuromodulation of uh, the splenic nerve and its innervation of the spleen can elicit changes in uh, T-cell macrophage activation as well as TNF-alpha. So they, they call this sub-organ ultrasound stimulation. What's interesting is they took the same idea that they showed with the spleen that they can modulate, you know, like TNF-alpha levels. And, and so that's, that's traditional cholinergic modulation of 
anti-inflammation, right, or modulation of, of cytokine activity, pro-inflammatory cytokines. They did the same thing using focused ultrasound targeted to the liver, right? So hepatic branches, the vagus nerve innervate the liver, and they're able to modulate blood glucose levels, right? And so they can do this in both DBDB as well as OB, OB mice, so diabetic mice and uh, uh, obese mice. Um, and so they, there's good early indications that not only can you modulate the, the inflammatory responses and inflammatory reflexes, but you can also modulate uh, metabolism and alter blood glucose levels. Medtronic and uh, a group at the University of Minnesota, both of these have been funded by DARPA, by the way. This has also been funded by DARPA, Hubert Lim. They've shown that they can modulate, um, again, splenic activity in models of rheumatoid arthritis. And I believe they're now running a human clinical trial. They showed that there was a reduction in gene expression and other uh, reduction in uh, proteins related to inflammation and pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so now they're running a trial um, in humans. Extending on this, there's many other diseases, systemic diseases um, that can be altered using this pathway. So here's another paper that's shown that you can use ultrasound to reduce uh, inflammation in a model of colitis. Um, neuroinflammation modulated by ultrasound and a model of acute kidney injury. Um, and again, this goes, these are basically vagal modulated effects that uh, you're modulating norepinephrine and the release of norepinephrine on uh, beta-2 adrenergic receptors and then alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and that's classic release of cytokine activity. We have shown that you can, so our group has shown that you could modulate somatosensory activity um, in a way that mimics activity of natural patterns in the brain, right? So the EEG patterns and the fMRI patterns that you see in the brain are very similar to the somatosensory sensations that you can generate. But Leonid Gavrilov and many other people, uh, Pierre Murad, there's a group of individuals that have shown for a long time, it's been described since back in the 60s, that you can generate somatosensory effects using ultrasound. And depending on um, the, the length of the, the duration of the, the, the waveform, uh, the pulsing of the waveform, the intensity of the waveform, you can produce different effects. And I think we wanted to show that you get these natural types of sensations because there's a certain type of technology that uses, Juan mentioned, John mentioned earlier, radiation force, right? And so there's a certain type of technology that uses ultrasound to produce radiation force and somatosensory receptors, and that's called um, mid-air haptics or, or um, ultrasonics. There's a company named Ultrasonics, but you can basically generate airborne uh, acoustic holograms that can be touched and felt and interacted with. And then at the same time, you can digitally transpose an, an optical hologram onto that acoustic hologram. And so now you see the dial and feel the dial, but there's nothing there. It's an optical hologram superimposed with the uh, uh, acoustic hologram, right? And so being able to understand the, the, where that goes was something that we were very interested in. Um, and uh, it's, that technology is, you know, it's being used in, in video game applications. Um, it's being used in, you know, I've heard of ATMs, they're thinking about generating ATMs. Bosch uh, has started to look at this in electric cars and appliances. And then Facebook has, has rumored to uh, want to be able to type through people's skin. And one of the ways to do this with high resolution would be using ultrasound. Um, lastly, the opportunities in ultrasound. We, uh, so we, this was my academic lab uh, and uh, Sonic Concepts several years ago um, with some other academic collaborators from Johns Hopkins and, and uh, uh, other universities wanted to develop a, a full turnkey system to allow people to, from any laboratory, to be able to use the tool um, a tool, a turnkey tool to focus on ultrasound and its interaction with biological matter, right? And so there's no reason that you should have to build all this from scratch using components off the shelf, trust a postdoc to write some code, maybe not even a postdoc, maybe an undergrad to write some code, nothing against undergrads, but um, some of them actually code better than postdocs, most of them actually. Um, nonetheless, it, it takes a lot of work to build a custom rig and a custom system to do this. And I saw this in optics, right, in the very early days of multi-photon microscopy. People were building custom microscopes, 
<clears throat> someone leaves the lab, no one can ever run the machine again because no one knows the MATLAB code or has any idea how to control some component, right? And so I was like, that can't happen with ultrasound or the field will go nowhere. So we applied to NSF for a Neuronext grant and we had high marks. I don't know why they didn't award the grant, they didn't. Um, they awarded it to some optogenetic technique, right? Which had been, at that point had become ubiquitous and turnkey in most laboratories. So in response to that, my company decided to partner with Sonic Concepts and Brainbox to launch uh, Neurofus um, last year. And so this is a partnership we've committed ourselves to being able to develop and, and deliver safe and effective and reliable turnkey systems that will ena enable scientists and engineers and physicians and clinicians to focus on the problems at hand and not on recreating monstrous hardware that will only be an in of one and no other laboratory will ever have anything like it, right? And so we all need to use the same type of thing, the same thing, common language, common definitions, common safety outputs and metrics. And so that's what we did. So you can check out the website and get in touch with Brainbox. Um, they've been amazing to work with. I get up at three o'clock in the morning, some mornings just to be able to talk to them. At like maybe four, I have to wake up a little bit first, but they're amazing to work with. And I can't say enough about uh, Kyle and Sonic Concepts. They've also really been uh, tremendous to work with. So where does the field go from here? Broadband phased arrays, siliconized transducers. Um, so basically MEM substrates, uh, the such as CMUTs or PMUTs, they're capacitive micro machined ultrasonic transducers or piezo machine micro machined ultrasonic transducers can be made into many channel counts, thin, flexible. You can mount an ASIC or an ARAM or other some type of beam forming, basically application specific integrated circuit onto the transducer and then a battery and it's all in one, right? Um, so the the, the where engineering starts to pick up on the transducers and look at the, the state of the art and the maturity of transducers and where that meets neuroscience is going to be really exciting. Um, spatial resolution, temporal resolution is cost effective. It can be made small. You can, you know, like you can essentially have a sheet that wraps over the head with, uh, you know, like a million transducers these days. Um, what I'm really excited about, one of the things I'm really excited about are acoustic hologram. I, li I like holography. Um, but acoustic holograms. And so being able to use, like when tra sound travels through a media, right, or a material, um, <clears throat> it's, it, 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 from, a, from a fundamental standpoint, a wave physics standpoint, it behaves very similar to light. But you can use materials such as plastics, right, to, to, and, and create lenses with plastics or metals. And so that opens up 3D printing. And 3D printing very simple disks are, can create, it it's essentially becomes a metamaterial. And then that metamaterial will, all, will not only allow you to generate holograms, but will allow you to get around the diffraction limits that are posed by ultrasound if there are any concerns there. And for, for operating in the brain, the frequencies are operating, I don't think there's many concerns. And then um, I mentioned these MEMS transducers. I think this is like, there's a several groups um, in Korea now that have shown that uh, mice walking around with ultrasound transducers on their head and they're treating Parkinson's disease symptoms in, in these mouse models. So for the new investigators, um, I think the, 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 what you should look out for right in the future, like look, there's gonna be a lot of funding opportunities. It's not like when I began, like I, I would knock on NIH's door nonstop and they would just be like, oh, no, no, whatever. I was like, okay, whatever. So <clears throat> there's money now, um, there's a real field, there's private industry money, there's um, money from NIH and NSF. I would stay tuned into the Focused Ultrasound Surgery Foundation and NIH. I know they're having a workshop in a few weeks um, uh, that they're gonna focus on ultrasonic neuromodulation, conducting expanded safety analyses and studies. I don't think that you can overdo um, an analysis of the safety. Um, enhanced visualization and targeting methods. We've talked about this, right? But being able to use some of the neuro navigation, I think we have an ability to be more precise with ultrasound in the laboratory than TMS will ever become. We already beat the spatial resolution. We can already target deeper brain resolutions, but in terms of precision, precision is a completely different thing. But in terms of precision, right, and accuracy, there's no way that TMS will be able to compete as soon as we start to build out the right modeling and the right computational dosimetry as Brad discussed, right? Like it's just, it's not even gonna be a fair game. Um, 
So continued mechanism of action study, I think is a real paradigm shift in biology and neurobiology and understanding mechanosensitive channels and how mechanosensitive channels give rise to emergent properties. They've been completely overlooked and ignored. Our models, the, the hodgkin huxman model of, of, of excitable cells, right? Or the GHK expanded version of the hodgkin huxman models or the Nernst equation. It, there's no thermodynamics that, that go into the equation. So there's a whole group of individuals that believe in membrane dynamics and how membrane dynamics and, and across different uh, solid and fluid crystal states can, can start to uh, alter emergent properties in the, in the brain. Expanded translational studies, clinical applications we've talked about and in development of high resolution brain machine interfaces. You know, I don't, if you pay any attention to neurotechnology, you saw a few weeks ago, Elon Musk recording from pigs and you know, his company Neuralink, they have a sewing machine that's gonna like sew an electrode in your brain as they miss the blood vessels. That's gonna be awesome. Um, but with ultrasound, right, you can achieve the same, on, on the order of the same spatial resolution with even small threaded electronics, just because of the spatial distribution of the electric field, right? It's not the size of the electrode, it's the spatial distribution of the electric field that's produced by the electrode. Um, but it, you will have high resolution, especially when you can apply holography and use metamaterials to get around the diffraction limits. I think that, uh, again, I don't even know if Neuralink would be able to, well, they could, they just have to start doing it using ultrasound. Um, lastly, um, kind of a lesson here for the young scientist. Um, so in June this year, like, uh, Science wrote a nice little article about aiming ultrasound at the brain raises hope for new treatments. It's kind of an update on the field. Nature published one a few years ago. Um, but for me, this was things had come full circle and I'll explain why uh, in just a second. But, um, you know, there were a couple quotes from individuals and I think, I, I guess like it was really satisfying to see that there's now a field, right? There's a field that's been born out of this idea of using low intensity um, ultrasound to modulate and alter brain activity. And there was a lot of doubt very early. Um, we still don't know everything. There's a lot of doubt very early in those days. And in particular, as a young investigator, when I was fighting to try to get NIH money, right? I would get these, I remember being at Virginia Tech and I went there, this, one of my early neurobiology professors and I worked in the department that he created at UAB, Mike Friedlander, built a, a new school there, a new kind of he helped build a new medical school, a research institute associated with the medical school. And so I went there to have the opportunity to translate what we had done into humans, right? He's like, look, there's MRIs, you can just do whatever you want, right? And I was like, this is great, um, this is awesome. But Mark George came one day, right? And so for those of you that have neuromodulation, you know Mark is the editor in brain stimulation. And so Mark George came and it was right after I'd gotten a study section review back from NIH that Mark George was the, the, the chair of that study section. And uh, I remember him, I said, Mike, I need two minutes with Mark, right? So uh, I got to spend a little bit of time with Mark and I, and I remember telling him like, look, ultrasound has so much tremendous promise that this has to be funded. I understand why it can't get funded. And Mark looked at me and said, uh, you can't focus ultrasound through the skull. And I was like, what are you talking about? And so we showed him in a, in a bucket, right? And Mark probably remembers this. We showed him in a bucket, like we took a skull and we just showed him like you can transmit ultrasound through the skull. And so this is a quote from Mark, right? Like Medical University of South Carolina is running a, a transcranial focused ultrasound workshop in a couple of weeks, um, which is where he is. But they started studying with Sasha Vestritsky, the ability to modulate pain in the thalamus, right? And so uh, this quote, from him on the effects that they got is that it's definitely a double green light is a very important lesson to the young investigators. And part of the reason that I was funded by DARPA is, is, and had a young faculty award. And what they taught you working with DARPA is the things that you work on are initially the things that are impossible and you work until you make them improbable and you work until you make them inevitable, right? And so that quote from Mark saying that we've now got a double green light the fact that they're having a transcranial focused ultrasound workshop at, at Medical University of South Carolina, um, and the fact that you know NIH is now starting to to fund this stuff and they're having workshops, I think it's opened it up for new investigators. But the important point is they're like, look, you have to have your eyes set on the goal, and even if the rest of the world thinks that it's impossible, you just have to keep you just you isolate yourself, you find a way to fund your work, you do your science, and you get it to. It's, it may not become in, inevitable. But at some point, if it does, it's really satisfying. And so with that, I'm going to stop and thank you. Thanks, Jamie. That, that's been absolutely, well, at least my mind is blown. And, and 
I've been using ultrasound for uh, a little while. And I also have the feeling that at the moment, it, it really is inevitable. Um, I can see that ultrasound is now very rapidly become accepted, even by all these in the field like uh, Mark George. Um, this was a terrific overview from the past, the present and uh, the future. There were a few questions that people raised and I'm actually going to start with um, Spencer Brinker. Uh, Spencer, we're going to try to get you to unmute to ask your question. There you go. You hear me all right? Yep. Yep. Hey, thanks, Tyler. I, I really have been following your work, your past work and your current work and it's really inspired me to do what I want to do with my career. So I appreciate the effort. Uh, but I'll just keep it a very quick one. You know, I read all the studies where you have to introduce a sham because of the, the audible perception of the PRF being down, you know, mainly at 500 hertz or one kilohertz. And I know that uh, you might be playing with the um, neuromodulation mechanism if you boost that PRF up. And of course, you'd have to take in consideration the intensity and the duty cycle and all this. But is it even possible to go up past, you know, what is it, 20, 20 or 25 kilohertz? I'm not sure what humans stop hearing, but to get rid of that audible yeah. stimulus. So, so that's a great question. So I've heard a lot about these auditory effects, right, for multiple years now. So one of the best ways to, so let's first talk about the, the, the source of the auditory um, event, right? And so when you use single element transducers, this tends to be a problem more than with phased arrays because of the way the single element transducers are, are they're made, right? And so they're typically layers of materials that are epoxied together. And there's a, a plate of electrodes, right, that, that go on the outside of the, the, the material. And so you deliver a high voltage to those materials and those materials expand and contract and that's what produces the ultrasound. And so there are acoustically audible phenomenon that are associated with the production of the ultrasound that are independent of the ultrasound, okay? So that's one source. A second source is what you alluded to is the pulse repetition frequency. And that's a little bit harder to get around um, because it, and it's not necessarily the frequency, but it's the onset and the offset of the waves, right? So the impulse characteristics that can produce sound in the skull. Right. And so there's audible sounds become trapped. In fact, there's there's headphones that work on using this property of, of uh, transmission, sound transmission and skull bone. And so because skull is so dense, it's like it has a high speed of sound. It can generate <clears throat> almost 3D sound just based on one insertion point. Right. And you can modulate the, the pulse repetition frequency and that will alter both the first source of the noise as well as the second source that I mentioned. One way to deal with this is the, the coupling efficiency, right? And so we've worked really hard on finding hydrogels and, and soft polymers, silicones that, that allow us to couple really effectively with the skin. And then we use high quality transducers and it hasn't been much of an issue. The last couple of things I'll say about this is we use, if you go back to the, the slide where I had, I showed the experiments from my grad student, we use noise canceling headphones and they tend to work really well to get rid of some of the first type of noise that I talked about. And then the last thing I'm gonna say is everyone forgets, this is not a problem that's specific to ultrasound. This is a problem that's specific to putting an energy source into the body, right? And so you have to deal with the mechanical engineering such as TMS. TMS has a notoriously loud clicking noise, right? That John Rothwell and many other people have studied, click, 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 click. Stuart um, Baker has shown that the, via the rubral spinal tract, right? Induces plasticity just based on the clicking. And so the same thing with TDCS and TMS, uh, TACS, people will hear or they'll feel auditory or skin sensations. And so masking those is like the bane of the exist your existence if you're dealing with a human, right? Because a human can say, oh, I can hear that. Guess what? The mouse can't say that, right? Like, or the, the gerbil can't say that. So it's just one of those problems you have to continue to deal with, design your experiments in a way that you can deal with it. But I certainly would not let it prohibit you from moving ahead. Wow, Jamie, I, I fully support that, actually. Um, let's not be inhibited to move ahead. I'm going to um, um, allow one further question, and maybe then we can open it up for general discussions. So, uh, Ben, I think there's a question from you. Hi, yeah, Hi, can yeah, everybody can hear me? Yeah. Oh, 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 there's a... Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. 
Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, thank you, first of all, for the talk. It was absolutely fascinating. So you mentioned that for high intensity transcranial focused ultrasound used to ablate tissue in people with tremor, um, they first transi transiently apply the stimulation and then um, see whether the tremor goes away, right? So you're using this uh, biological or phenomenological response to kind of validate that you're stimulating accurately. I was interested to know whether um, you know of or think of any uh, potential targets where low intensity ultrasound applied to the human brain could elicit any biological or phenomenological responses that you could use to validate stimulating at a spatially accurate location. Yeah, so that's that's a great question um, and something we've thought about, right? So you have the same problem when you're treating depression using TMS, right? So when you're using TMS over the motor cortex, there's a behavioral phenomenon and a fast feedback of that behavior, the twitch of the hand or the finger or whatever, right? And so when you're working in neuropsychiatric indications and you're targeting the prefrontal cortex, there's no overt behavior that's associated with that, right? And so the problem is the same that um, you have with with um, focused ultrasound is that there, you can't always produce an overt behavior. People have described sensations like visual sensations or like phosphines <clears throat> that could be used, right? But then if you, as soon as you move to an area where you're not going to produce an over, overt behavior, such as a brain circuit that's responsible for conflict resolution or emotional evaluation of some, you know, A versus B, you're not going to see a behavior, right? And so I think it's a, I think it's something in the same, the same is true for electrical stimulation, right? So, I mean, if you have an, an, an electrode, right? So with DBS patients, right? So they may not respond to DBS for treatment of a neuropsychiatric disorder for some time, right? And you, there's no way of knowing whether it's working or not. It's again, a challenge we have to work with, a, a challenge we have to work through. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to answer it, but yes, I would love to be able just to say, yes, we're going to hit the laughter spot in the brain and we know exactly where that is. You point the beam there, you hit it, neither the person laughs or not. And if they don't laugh, you know that hundred percent of the times, if you're in the laughter spot, they're going to laugh. You just move to the, you just keep moving until you find it. Right. So I don't know. It's a tough problem. You know, that's why I, I, I like to work on the easy problems of just getting this going and then saying, look, the, now the hard problems are, are the, the next generations. Thanks, Jamie. Um, thanks, everybody. There, there are still, still a few open questions. Maybe we can even try to answer some of them offline or on the forum. Um, but for now, um, I'm also opening up for general question, maybe to any of the other panelists, if you have a question about um, Christina's or Tulika's presentation. So, Leonard, there are two questions that came up right here. <clears throat> I just want to answer real quick. So one was from Mohammed regarding skull attenuation with the neurotrack device. So we were, um, the, the skull attenuation didn't have to do with the neurotruck device itself, but it had um, uh, to do with uh, the transducer. And so when we looked at the attenuation, it was no more than what other people had reported at that time. And so there's probably about 90% loss and that's just standard, right? And so I think that's that's something you can you you're transmitting energy across the skull, and the energy is absorbed or diffracted and, and reflected and lost. So, another question from um, Joanne Nash. Um, so Joe asked about uh, mechanoreceptors and whether mechanoreceptors could provide um, whether they mechanoreceptors and glial cells could provide kind of a mechanism of action for some of the long-term positive effects. I think absolutely, right? Like this is something that's been completely overlooked. I had a student one time that was in my lab and he did a rotation project in my lab where we took, um, they were GFP labeled cells, but they were from a human glioblastoma. And so they're essentially astrocytes, right? And so what we found was that those cells were more sensitive than neurons and then, and then and more sensitive than astrocytes that were from a mouse, right? That were not glioblastoma derived. So I think what, and when you look at cancer and cancer metastases, right? So glial cells tend to play a large role in this because they are the probably the most sensitive cells in the brain in terms of most, most mechanically sensitive, right? So they respond to stress and tension a lot. And so I think it's probably, there's probably a lot of hidden gems inside of looking at glial biology and the, the ability of ultrasound to modulate gliobiology, and then secondarily, 
and, and that having a therapeutic effect independent of neurons, right? So I think it's a, definitely a good area to focus on.